Hello, I'm Amy. Welcome to the Snapvise YouTube channel. We're going to have a talk today about applying your A-level biology knowledge in an unseen context. In A-level exams, questions often pop up with examples that you as the student may have never seen before. These questions are designed so that you as the student can show off your ability to critically analyse the question, identify what's being asked, and then apply your knowledge of the course content. However, where students have historically been asked to apply their biological knowledge in an unfamiliar context, they are often left feeling like they were tested on something that they weren't taught in lessons. This isn't a nice feeling to have and if that question comes up early in the exam paper and you're not prepared, it can throw you off for the whole of the paper. When we've asked A-level biology teachers to tell us what they think students often struggle with, this is something that comes up time and time again. It's students being unable to answer questions that come from an unfamiliar context. To quote one teacher, um, recognising exactly what the questions are asking. For example, if the question is about dolphins, some get blinkered thinking that they've not been taught about dolphins, rather than realising that understanding of mammals can be applied to the question. If you've ever felt like this when doing past paper questions, it's probably just because there's a small gap in your knowledge and that coupled with the unfamiliar context of the question has just thrown you off and left you unable to answer the question properly. So with a bit more revision and an awareness of this type of question you should be okay. So for this video I have collated three questions which will challenge you to use your A-level biology learning in a context that you may not have seen before. Don't panic we'll go through each of them and talk about what we need to think about when approaching this kind of question. I haven't allocated marks for these questions because the first thing that I want you to do is start approaching questions as a biologist rather than as someone being examined. This should make you think about the subject in a slightly different way so not just thinking, how am I going to get four marks for this response, but thinking, what do I know about this topic and how can I relate it to the example that the examiner's given me? After you've watched this video, maybe go on and do um, some slightly longer past paper questions and putting what you've learned in this video into practice. So question one, I'm just going to read it off the iPad here. So question one says, glowworms in the UK tend to be found in limestone habitats with lots of snails for their larvae to feed on. Despite their name, glowworms are actually insects which produce bioluminescence. They do this through a chemical reaction in their abdomen between oxygen and luciferin, which combine to produce oxyluciferin. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme luciferase. How does luciferase work to catalyze the reaction which produces bioluminescence, and how does its involvement with the reaction affect its structure? So with these kinds of questions, you find that they present you with lots of information and then ask you the question. So we've got basically a small paragraph here about glowworms before the question has come along. So the first thing we want to do is identify exactly what the question is and then highlight the essential information that we've been provided. Next, we can identify the topic that this relates to and then start using our knowledge of this topic to think about forming an answer. The question's asking us how the enzyme catalyzes a chemical reaction and what happens to the structure of the enzyme when this happens. So this question clearly relates to our knowledge of proteins and the induced fit mechanism and the way in which the tertiary structure of an enzyme gets altered when it binds to the substrate. We want to talk about the substrate being complementary to the enzyme active site and the way in which the substrate reduces the activation energy required for the reaction to take place. To relate our response to the question and avoid just regurgitating all the things we know about this topic, we need to make sure that we are including keywords that relate back to the question. So luciferase binds to oxygen and luciferin to create an enzyme substrate complex, which reduces the activation energy required for the reaction between oxygen and luciferin to take place. The reactants bind at the active site and alter the tertiary structure of luciferase when they bind. Finally, we will review the question and check that we've answered it in full, making sure that we have haven't missed any small questions that might have been in the main paragraph of the text. Checking that your answer actually satisfies what the question has asked is very important, not just for this kind of question, but for all of your exam questions. If you haven't responded properly, then you simply won't get all the marks. Now we've done one question, let's have a look at another one, and this time see if you can challenge yourself by pausing it and then working through it yourself before we go through it together. So question two. Pranayama is a technique used in Ashtang yoga whereby breathing is controlled voluntarily rather than automatically. Using the graph below, describe how an individual breathes during the first 60 seconds of pranayama. There are two stages to this breathing technique. 
describe the role of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and how this enables ventilation. So this question has two parts. The first part is asking us to interpret a diagram that they've provided to demonstrate our understanding of respiratory rate recordings. And then after this is asking us to share our knowledge of the muscular mechanism behind ventilation, in particular about the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. For part one, we will look at the graph. So this question has asked us to focus on the first 60 seconds of the breathing, which is this bit just here. The line is moving sharply up and down, um, which demonstrates that the individual being recorded is breathing in and out with a full breath cycle once every roughly 10 seconds. So to answer this, we would say that the individual is taking deep breaths in and out at approximately 10 second intervals. In the last 10 seconds, they are holding the exhale. And we know this because there's a flat line between 50 and 60 seconds. Now, the next part of the question is thrown in a bit of a red herring by stating that there are two stages to the breathing technique. This is correct, but it's irrelevant. We don't need to talk about that second part of the technique, despite it being presented and mentioned. What we have been asked to do is describe the role of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and how this enables ventilation. So the essential piece of information to recall here is how these muscles work together to increase and decrease the pressure within the thoracic cavity, which in turn expels and intakes air through the respiratory system. So to breathe in, as you should know, the external intercostal muscles contract and the internal intercostal muscles relax. At the same time, the diaphragm contracts and flattens, which increases the volume. By doing this, we have actually reduced the pressure within the thoracic cavity to below atmospheric pressure. To expire, the external intercostal muscles relax and the internal intercostal muscles will then contract. As it moves upwards, it increases the pressure within the thoracic cavity by decreasing the available space, which means that air gets pushed out and we breathe out. So the mechanical process of our muscles contracting, relaxing, and increasing and decreasing the pressure and the volume within our thoracic cavity is how ventilation works. To answer this in an exam, we may need to be more concise, but what we've done here is identify exactly what the question's asking. We've taken the yoga concept out of the way. The yoga is irrelevant. Basically, what we need to do is get down to the science of what's going on. Science is applicable in almost every single aspect of life, and that's what the examiner is trying to show you with these questions. And they're challenging you to try and take that knowledge into the real world and not just stay within sort of the safe confines of the specification. So let's do one last question just to really solidify our approach. Question three. Now this one's a bit of a beast so make sure you're listening well. Black caps are a species of passerine which exhibit innate migratory behaviour inherited genetically. Some spend their winter in Britain and Ireland which migrate to Germany to breed and others spend their winter in Spain and also migrate to Germany to breed. Recent studies demonstrate that black caps which spend their winter further north prefer to breed with each other rather than with black caps which winter at more southerly latitudes. Wintering territories in Britain and Ireland are of a higher quality than those in the south and are closer to the German breeding ground than Spanish winter territories. In addition to this, Britain and Ireland are very fond of their garden birds putting out food for them throughout the year. Explain how this preference in migration behaviour among black caps is a potential mechanism for speciation. We've been presented with a lot of information here, so let's have a pick through it. First, let's identify the question. We need to explain how the black cap's preference in migration behaviour of their partner could drive speciation, that is, the branching off of a new species of black cap. So firstly, black cap migratory behaviour is innate and inherited genetically. So what innate means is that they somehow know how to do it um, without being taught and this understanding is inherited through their genetics. You should spot straight away that this question is asking us to show our knowledge of adaptation and species. Behavioural traits um, can also work in the same way that we're familiar with phenotypic traits working. So a pair of northern wintering black caps that breed will produce offspring which then also make a winter migration north rather than south because they've inherited this from their parents. And the same works for um, a pair of southern wintering black caps. So two black caps that breed with each other that prefer to winter in Spain will produce offspring that also somehow know how to make their way to Spain for the winter. This in itself is a driver of speciation because you've got these sympatric populations of breeding birds. So sympatric meaning that they all breed in the same geographical area are segregating through assortative mating depending on the wintering preference of their partner. Obviously over time if only northern birds and only southern birds breed with each other um, they could become genetically distinct. Next we know that northern winter territories tend to be higher quality compared to southern winter territories and they're closer to the German breeding ground. 
So a higher quality territory should make for a higher quality bird because there is more availability of energy and other resources that this bird can use to look after itself during the winter and then prepare for migration in the summer. Being closer to the breeding ground as well means that they're not using up as much of their resources so that when they do get there they have more energy to put into finding a suitable partner and then raising healthy chicks. So that last question really did draw on lots of our knowledge that we have about evolution and natural selection and some of the pressures that animals have within their ecosystems. So that really is showing how you can link all of these topics across your specification to answer a question with an Seen context. In your A-level biology exam you will simply never be asked a question about a topic that you've not been taught. You will however be asked to apply your knowledge using examples that you may not know about. Overall a calm and logical approach is the best way forward to these questions um, and to any question if you come across one in the exam that you really think you don't know just try and take a breath Think about it in a very calm way and the answer should hopefully come to you. Um, if not immediately, then come back to the question, but it should always come to you if you've done your revision. Make sure that you know your course content inside and out before you go to the exam and make sure that you're tackling harder questions in your active recall practice. These often use your spec topics in a much wider context, so it kind of gives you um, an immunity to seeing these questions for the first time. You shouldn't be too freaked out. Thank you so much for watching and good luck with your revision. If you are looking for some more help with your A-level biology, then check out this playlist. If you aren't already subscribed to Snap Provise, you can do that just here. And give this video a like to save it to your profile so you can take a look at it again at some point in the future.